All right, so now we are in the interview portion of the show. Very special guest in studio. It's a very rare thing for us to have people in studio. We don't know what you're doing here, <laughs> but Stan Bowman, general manager of the Blackhawks, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, th- that is the first question. What are you doing here? <laughs> Why, I mean, you came all the way out to your Ukrainian village in this little office, so what, what's the point of all this? Into the lines then. I don't know, yeah. just trying to get to know you guys a little better. I think w- one of the things that we're trying to do a better job of is communicate better. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, I'll take uh, the bullet for that. We haven't done as good a job as we could have as far as uh, letting people know what we're doing. And, um, you know, I think uh, looking forward, we, we got to have some conversations and, Mm -hmm. and I'm here to talk. Okay. All right. Now, you don't have to take bullets if they don't deserve the bullets. <laughs> so if you want to shed blame on anybody, you just do that. This is we're this is a tell the truth room. Gotcha. So gotcha. feel free to shoot bullets at me, anyone else. Um, I guess like when I kind of have a lot of questions. We've never interviewed a GM before. Sure. So you have a lot of questions of like just what your day to day job mm-hmm. is like. So like take us through it. Like just kind of start with like the beginning of your day. Like what do you? What is something that you really? like set out to do do you have like a mission statement that you try to like live by or how does how does a day go well i, I guess it, it's uh it changes by what the time of year so mm-hmm. right now you know we've we've passed through the, the draft so the focus up until a week ago was the draft and uh it's an important part on our calendar so we've been spending almost a year now mm-hmm. well actually over a year because this draft was later than normal so that was a big focus once our playoff ended you know from the end of august until early october it was it was draft focused um and the other part is with free agency happening a couple days after the draft you know that's another time when you can reshape your team so there was a lot of conversations uh, amongst hockey ops with preparing for how what moves we might make and uh you know we can talk about that at some point but now we've transitioned past that and this is kind of the quiet part of our season. So mm-hmm. typically this is in July and August. Uh, not a lot happening around the league. You know, there's some arbitration cases. Uh, we don't have any arbitrations this year. So uh, really it's going to be pretty quiet until camp starts back up. But uh, So you're going on vacation. You put the letter <laughs> out and then you're getting out of town. Uh, I don't know if I'm going on vacation. Where can you go on vacation these days? It's true. With, uh, the circumstances so um is that typical though july august is when you get the villa in cabo or whatever or what do you you know no no villa in cabo for me but uh it's a quiet time yeah like play some golf and just kind of relax a bit it's it's a you know it's a a lot of uh stuff the busiest time of our year actually in a normal year is from probably march until july um because you, you certainly, hopefully your team's still playing, you got the playoffs, and then you've got all of your off-season prep, you've got players to sign, you've got draft preparation, you've got free agency, you've got contracts. Uh, so that's our busiest time of the year, traditionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when you get to July and August, that's when it's our quietest time. Uh, but then it ramps back up, you know, with training camp, usually starts right after Labor Day, and it's a whole different set of priorities at that point. How do you how how has COVID kind of changed that for you? Because I feel like everyone has that vi- visualization of you being on the draft floor. You're on the phone. You're shaking hands. You're talking to people. Now, like this draft, it was much different situation. So, have, has that impacted your ability to make moves? Do you think, or have a, a more communication, or how do you how do you navigate that? What's your phone plan like? Well, <laughs> people always make fun of me because I'm on I'm on the phone a lot, yeah. and that's true. Uh, part of the reason that is because most of the guys that work in hockey ops they're not in chicago so Mm -hmm. you know even in a normal year when we are in the office let's just take COVID aside um you know i'm in the office often you know when i'm in chicago i'm there but most of all of our scouts aren't here so for me to stay in touch with amateur scouts pro scouts um development guys Mm -hmm. they're all scattered around the country so i'm on the phone a lot just trying to stay connected with them i think You know, I learned a long time ago when I started doing this job that uh, before I became general manager, you know, it can be a lonely job for people that are out in the field. They don't feel as connected to the team if you don't communicate with them. So Mm -hmm. for me, 
you know, it's important to stay in touch with those guys. So that's why I am on the phone quite a bit. Well, uh, I mean, we understand that 95% right. of our company is in New York <laughs> okay. and we're out here. So we're definitely, we get the isolation thing. Uh, in terms of being on the phone, is that how you found out that McDonough was fired? And what was your like initial reaction when you were hearing that news or first got that news? Yeah, I got a phone call from Rocky. Um, yep. So it was just a quick phone call. Let, let, they let me know that, you know, they made a change. They were going in a different direction. Uh, it was a brief call, uh, maybe a minute. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like a lot of discussion in that conversation. And yeah, I was surprised. I, I didn't know um, that that was coming. So, uh, you know, I had a, a, a great relationship with John. I mean, he gave me a chance to be a GM, so I'll, I'll forever be thankful for that. So, um, so yeah, I wasn't expecting that. How has your job and how you handle it day to day changed since he left and Danny has come in? How are their leadership styles different? Uh, well, I mean, the biggest change is just that it's been the pandemic. So we've mm -hmm. been remote. Like I got a chance to spend the time in Edmonton with Danny. So we were, we were with one another for that whole three weeks or whatever it was. So I got a chance to see him every day. We spent, you know, multiple hours per day eat, having meals together, going to games together. So I had known Danny prior to that because um, he was around, but he mm -hmm. wasn't super involved with the team. So I knew him probably more in passing or casually. And uh, I mean, they're different people, obviously. John's, you know, age-wise, they're yeah. different. Uh, they have different styles. Uh, but I, I'm pretty flexible. So I, I could, I worked well with John. I, I'm working great with Danny. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't need one specific style to work with. So was John involved in hockey ops? Like you watch those behind the scenes things on draft day, the, what is it? The on the clock. And it seems like he was very present, but I couldn't tell if that was for show or if that was like he's sitting in on these meetings and offering opinions on players or moves or how involved was he in your in your day-to-day -day? did you talk to him every day about hockey moves uh yeah i would talk, i mean most every day i was in the office john mm -hmm. was in the office a lot so i, I would see him uh, we would talk if, if i was on the road or something we would talk as well uh i think the best way to describe it would be i think john he loved to ask questions mm -hmm. and i think in the process of that he he would always it's not even it sounds bad but i would say he would always be challenging you but he was trying to make sure that when you, he would ask you questions like explain that to me what were you thinking there not so much because he would say well you're wrong it would be more to try to make sure that you've thought it through and that your explanation would would make sense to him so i think he was uh naturally uh, a curious guy he asked a lot of questions mm -hmm. and that was so he was he would be in our meetings, but it, I mean, he, like scouting meetings, he hadn't seen any of these guys play. So right. he would just sort of ask questions. But uh, but he's uh, certainly familiar with a guy like Panarin. So if you make a big move, is, is that something that you it, he would ever say like, hey, like I'd like to, you know, this isn't working. I don't think this is working. Did he ever offer up any opinions or even suggestions um, uh, to you about how to run your department? No, I don't think so. No, no more so than I just described. He okay. would ask questions and say, Do, you know, does this make sense? Or what about this? What about that? But it was never, it was never to where he was saying, you need to do this. It was more okay. uh, food for thought type things. Okay. Are there people in hockey ops or, or even outside the organization? I know a lot has been made about, you know, your dad, Scotty, that you bounce ideas off or you have do you have a confidant that you're like hey like this is an offer i've received what do you think uh that's not really the way it happens i think mo you know the the rhythm of trades is more um it's multiple conversations mm -hmm. so i think you know my the way i've operated with other gms is you you check in with them on a regular basis even if you ha let's say that you have a player that you want to trade for mm -hmm you don't just call and say, I'd like to trade for that player. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying like you're getting to a point where you've had these conversations mm -hmm. with, uh, with Jake or whoever. Sure. Um, and you get to a point where like, here's what they're offering, you know, talk, call, well, use the, the Schmaltz Strom trade as an example. Mm -hmm. So you're right there. Yep. It's about, you're going to send the memo to the league is that at that point, is there somebody that you're like, Hey, Pierre, hey, dad, hey, whoever, do you like bounce ideas off of people or? Once it gets to that point, no, I think the decision is made. That's okay. more just sort of executing the deal. I mm -hmm. think leading up to that point, yeah, there's a lot of conversations. Um, 
it's not just one person though. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a group of guys that are in hockey ops that, Mm -hmm. um, that we, at the end of the day, it's my decision, but you know, I, I like to get, as many viewpoints as I can. And not everybody always agrees. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my dad's part of that, but probably not as much as some of the other people. Like I think you know, my dad's experience is more in the coaching era. So like, we'll ask him, what do you think of a player? And then as far as the, the deal points or building the deal, th- that's not really his role. He's more sure. T- he'll talk about like, well, this, this is what I see in, the, mm-hmm. uh, in Strom. You know, if you'll watch him and say, "Here's here's what kind of player I see there," uh, the deal itself that that's more the so it's Al McIsaac, Pierre Gauthier, in Europe. Matt Saline's been a, a big resource for us. Uh, Ryan Stewart, Kyle Davidson, Norm McIver. There, there's a lot of guys that would I would we would have kind of group calls mm-hmm. uh, where everyone would have their chance to weigh in and. Uh, you know, share the way they see it. It's not always unanimous. Mm-hmm. Like, like some guys like certain. I would players, hope others. not. No. Yeah, yeah. No, but I think you know. At the end of the day, and the, when we've had those kind of calls about trades which didn't happen, then I, they would bring up points which got me to where I, I didn't feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Like, so, even when you have dissension in the group, if if you feel you may not agree with it, and you may agree with it, and this guy over here. Uh, it's not like it's a, just a vote where three are in favor, two are against, so we're going to do it. It's, right. Well, you're the king. I mean, that's <laughs> like ultimately like well, you, yeah, yeah, you have true. your court and it, then ultimately it's your call. Yes, yeah, that's okay. true. And okay. I think, um, you know, what I like to get people's opinions and it's not, it's not just a yes, no, mm-hmm. we, we take a vote and then we do it. it. It doesn't really play out that way. Now you reorganized hockey ops. I think that message came out, uh, probably May, May or June, you guys were making some changes structurally. Yep. Is that something that came from Danny Rocky or is that a change that you had been eyeballing for a while? Like, how does that, pro- like, what was the point of that? <clears throat> um, and uh, what, what do you think the benefit will be? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> that was something I've had on my mind for a little bit of trying to get some new voices in the decision-making process. So the guys that I just mentioned there, um, you know, they were in those roles. So Pierre Gauthier was player personnel. Um, Mark Kelly was in charge of our amateur scouting. Ryan Stewart was in charge of our pro scouting. But what I was trying to do is to get some new voices in there. So Kyle Davidson, Mark Eaton, they were two guys who typically weren't uh, in the, Kyle had mostly been on the the salary cap side. Mm -hmm. Um, And he also did some scouting. But, uh, you know, I found his, I was impressed with his knowledge and I thought he was ready for a bigger role. So in trying to figure out how can we reorganize to give certain people new voices and also shift. So Norm was the one who moved into a new role in, in charge of player personnel. Uh, so in the past, that was really one person's job. That was Pierre Gauthier's primary responsibility. Okay. Player personnel is kind of a catch all term, but it refers to pro scouting, amateur scouting, free agents, North America and Europe. So it's it's a pretty big group of, of uh, people that you have mm-hmm. to cover. Uh, and th- that comes into play when you're looking at signing players or making trades um, or, or draft. It kind of encompasses all of those. So I just felt like it's a lot for one person to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, and Pierre had, Pierre's had a lot of experience. He was GM for several teams. Like he's, uh, he's knowledgeable, but I think we wanted to try to get more people supporting that group Mm -hmm. so that's why we shifted norm to be kind of in charge of that he's got a group of people that work underneath him because norm used to be just the assistant general manager and in that role he was more uh i guess of a a lone wolf like Mm -hmm. he and i were together but he didn't really have a group of people that reported to him sure so that was in the process mark eaton and kyle and ryan stewart now are sharing the assistant gm okay so you think that's good, that's a shift? It was kind of portrayed as a demotion for Norm. Do you see it that way? I think it was portrayed by outsiders that way. But that's why I'm asking. For yeah, clarification. no. Yeah. I think if anything, it gave him uh, bigger responsibility to, like I said, he's got now six or eight people that mm-hmm. he's in charge of that he has to delegate things to. And I think that's one of the things I learned moving up the ranks is you know when you're 
you're working your way up. You're assistant general manager. You have a lot. You're really in the nitty gritty of everything, and you know players. We love that term at Barstool. <laughs> you do nitty gritty. Okay, okay. big time. That's we love best. it. Yeah. So yeah. that's something that you have to sort of let go of that though, as you as you move up and become in a more managerial mm-hmm. role. You have to you have to delegate, mm-hmm. and you have to have people that you can trust to then go do things, but you've got to oversee them. You've got to give them guidance. You've got to give them direction. You've also got to give them room to do their job. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think Norm's role has shifted where it's a different skill set that he's, he's not so focused just on the Blackhawks team mm-hmm. as now he's out looking at all these different players and all these different teams. When you were making these changes, did you ever consider going outside the organization to bring in a name from a different organization? You're like, hey, like this guy, I feel like you probably can't comment on specific names, but like Drury's name is floated out there all the time. Is that something, did you do like an extensive search to find additional help? Or do you think that this reshuffling is going to be a dramatic change to what you guys do? Well, I'm not, I don't know if I'm looking for it to be a dramatic change. I think we're looking for, uh, we want to see, Part of it is try to give people who had been here a bigger opportunity. So Mm -hmm. when I say that, it was Kyle and Ryan Stewart and Mark Eaton. I felt that they were ready for a new opportunity and they could play a role in where we're headed. Uh, And I guess I want to see how this plays out before. I mean, that's an option to go outside. I think... I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer. Yeah. I was just wondering what your process was to for that. Sure. So I'm really interested in the process. Yep. So. And that, that's kind of how it played out. So, mm-hmm. that, no, it wasn't really a concerted effort to talk to people and try to bring in a, a new okay. voice. Okay. Um, let's talk about that letter a little bit today. Sure. Talked about, you know, seems like you're holding on to the core, at least for the immediate future. And when I say the core, I mean... To two, two seven nineteen eighty eight. Right, those guys, one way or another, contractually no movement clauses. There seems like they're going to be here. Mm-hmm. Is that safe to say for for at least twenty twenty one? Yep. Okay, that's fair to say. Okay, so you also talked about having to balance, you know, having to find new players, stockpile players. That comment, I'll be honest, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, because I look at a team that finished twelfth this year finished outside the playoffs year before outside the playoffs year before you've had you've had many draft picks and many drafts to to sort of replenish the system and and high draft picks and i think kirby doc looks like a great player but ultimately like isn't that isn't that something that falls on you uh being able to do that you've been here for for 10 years sure so how do you how do you explain how do you explain that that we don't have players but this has been my job to find players for 10 years yeah that's a fair criticism um i think for a while there i think where we're missing players is in that not so much in the 18 19 year old range but Mm -hmm. guys it would be 22 23 24 when we were chasing uh we were still chasing the we were kind of at the top trying Mm -hmm. to maintain that level yep you, you you do pay a price down the road and you start trading away draft picks or you trade away young players Mm -hmm. and in the process of doing that it's the same thing with the teams that are that are closer to winning right now they're expending assets they're not going to necessarily feel the the pain of that for a couple years they're Mm -hmm. going to feel it three or four years from now when all of a sudden they should have a really good 23 year old guy but they don't because they had a good one or they had two draft picks that they traded away so when i say rebuild it i we have started that. I think where we're missing, and that's true. I, I was the one that traded those players away or that uh, traded the draft picks away That mm-hmm. in trying to Absolutely. move things forward. And I, I, I do think you get too much criticism, certainly for the lad trade. Um, you make that trade 100 times out of 100, I think. You bring him in. You're trying to go for that cup in 2016. I think it's you know one of these things that gets brought up is that you know since 2010 you talk about Hayes never signed Dano McNeil's kind of a boss Taravainen and Schmaltz Yoki Haru and then you can even add Saad and Panarin those guys are all young players that never got to their second contract with the Blackhawks so if you're saying like oh we could really use a 24 year old well I mean Taravainen's right in that age Panarin's right in that age so I guess it's like where how how are we supposed to believe going forward that this is that we're on the right path and like, you know, the, the, that there is this right balance. And did you ever give a consideration to being like, you know, you're talking about this sustained success two, three, four years down the road. 
Well, at that point, maybe Taves and Kane and Keith are not good enough to be the guys anymore. So you're going to have to find players to replace them too. It, was there ever a distinction? Where it's like, let's just keep going for it. And then we'll let them walk at the end of the deal and start over. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly that's kind could, of two questions. There, yeah, I I, yeah, there's a lot of uh, things to, to I guess, comment well, on. Well, we can slow down. <laughs> yeah, let's take a drink and we'll slow down. Right. I think, um, like I said, the moves that you make when you are trying to stay at the top, they they really start to hit home four or five years later, which mm-hmm. is the fact that the, that the players that we've drafted um, are no longer Blackhawks. I guess I part of that I don't understand because the the goal when you're drafting a player is it's an asset mm-hmm. to it, it, they could be a Blackhawk asset for 18 years that's one option they could be a Blackhawk for five years and then you use them to try to get another player mm-hmm. or you could use them to get if you have uh, a strength in one area but weakness in another you can use it so as long as you're still using, as long as they're assets, like they're all players in the league. And so to me that you got to find the players, you got to identify who, mm-hmm. who are talented players. Uh, and then you've got to do one of two things with them, keep them and just keep them forever. And mm-hmm. they'll be Blackhawks their whole career. Um, but I would say that that's probably less and less likely in the modern NHL. I think, the number of players that are going to be drafted by their team and stay with their team forever, it's other than maybe the, the top uh, top five to ten, because that's really where your franchise-type mm-hmm. players come from. So the players that are drafted later on, if the fact that they get traded when they're 22, as long as they're traded for someone else who maybe helped you for a year or two and mm-hmm. then you use that, you're always – looking down the road to make sure that you're maintaining some kind of a, I don't want to say it's not a shell game, but it's, we've got this guy, he's really good Mm -hmm. and he could help us get that guy who we actually need right now. So that's, that's the reasoning behind those moves. And, uh, but now that we don't have a lot of those guys that we've traded away Mm -hmm. for trying to continue the thing going, we are paying a price for it now. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think I've been in your corner more than people would think. But it's, I have a hard time where it's like you you look around the league at some of these other trades, and I'm sure you don't want to speak to that. But it's like they, you know, Ottawa went a different route with Carlson, and they got a treasure trove back. Colorado, Matthew Shane, big time, fu- like all futures, and we didn't really see that with Panarin. You know, you got Panarin for what I would deem, you know, a lesser player uh, in Brandon Saad. And I love Brandon Saad, but he's not a, an MVP candidate and, and probably never will be. So is there a part of you that looks back at that deal and was like, I wish I either had the freedom to make a move that was for the future or that I wish I had just done that? Like, well, is there any hindsight? Sure. I mean, I, think I mean, that's, it's benefit of hindsight, of course. Yeah, I'm just wondering say. if you could go back in time. Would you, is there any like, oh, I wish I didn't do that? No, I I think if you if you look at it that way, then you're never you're never going to do anything. Mm-hmm. I think you've you've got to try to do in the moment what you think. Now they don't all work out, but I think you know, like the option would would have been k- keeping Panarin and not being able to resign him. And well, why do you say that? Because of the because of the money. So like you can't have you can't. We already have two guys making ten and a half mm-hmm. million. He, he he was it was apparent he was going to be making a lot of million dollars. Or, absolutely right. But you, you had Saad at six, the same cap hit, and then you also brought in guys like Ole Mata and Shaw, and I, and I think that you can make an argument that you're better off with Panarin at 11 than you are with Saad and Mata at 10, 10 and a half. Like the difference there is negligible in terms of what you could and couldn't afford, so then you have a replacement level third pair defenseman, but you're scoring... Yeah, but the, but you're not. It's not really a sustainable model to have three players making that kind of money. It just think, I don't think it's it works in the in the NHL of the modern day. It's hard to even have two guys at that mm-hmm. uh, that dollar amount. I think that's what that's the reality of where we're at. So I think we may not agree on that. I mm-hmm. mean, if you may have wanted to keep three eleven million dollar players on your team and just deal with the lower price guys, and I that, didn't. Okay, I didn't. I I was of the opinion back then and there's 
tweets and stuff that they should you should have traded Panarin. I was on board with that. Trading him for Saad felt, even at the time, was like a uh, I don't I don't know about this, but it was like in, he's got the three cups. Like in Stan, we trust. Like this is going to be, you know. And and I look back at that summer and the Jalmerson trade too, and it, it felt like the Jalmerson trade along. Uh, was something to look towards the future. And you said the same thing about the Saad trade at mm-hmm. the time. Like, we want cap predictability. He's here for two more years than, than Panarin was. Same thing with Jalmerson and, uh, and and Murphy, that trade off. It felt like you're dipping your toes into a rebuild in the sustainability model back then. And it seems like we're still having that same conversation. And now Saad's off the roster. And by the time the Hawks are good again, maybe Murphy is too camera guy tom i swear <laughs> um so then so then it's like was that move like then that to me like i hate to like throw like failure out there but like that that one is one that to me it doesn't look like it worked out because you made these moves to try to be sustained to s- sustain this thing right and then by the and then you don't make the playoffs in that stretch at all and then the guys that you made that move for are off the roster so like that i'm i'm having a hard time reconciling that well, I, yeah, they're off the roster, but they've brought other things that are on the roster. So it's like it's, as opposed to just allowing t- the, the contract to run out. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think if Murph is still here, I think he's still one of our better players. Like, I love him. Yep. So yeah. uh, I guess my point is if and now we've got Zadora off. So like Panarin has sort of turned into that by way of Brandon Sod. Certainly. But- so, so I guess my point is it's fine to say that's that's not how you would have done it and we did it with the intention of trying to continue to turn one asset into another asset mm-hmm. and then you use that asset for a period of time and then you look at where your team is and you then pivot and say okay well now this is what we need to do so you know it i don't i don't know if that's the answer that you're looking for but that's the thought process behind it okay i mean i all I'm, all I'm interested in is thought process. Sure. So that's all, you know, and it, it is a hard thing to reconcile because I am of the opinion that guys like Taves, Kane, and Keith just don't come around very often. And maybe that's, maybe that's just because of the, like where you're from. You went from Montreal with your dad to, to Buffalo, had Gilbert Perot, then he's in uh, Pittsburgh with Yager and Lemieux. I've been in Chicago where it's like you had Hull and Makita and then 50 years of nothingness. Sure. So it, I feel like it's, I, I, you want to max out on those. And I, I would have accepted a crater at the end in 2024 and just been like, let's start over. And I think it's hard to be like, hey, we're kind of starting over. And I'm just talking. I think this is like from a fan, obviously, like I think your job is extremely hard and uh, love what you've done with the three cups. It's hockey's back. But it's just it feels like the last five years have been tough to to stomach as a fan. And now we're almost being told that the next three are going to be tough, too. And do you feel that way? Like, what? How do you measure your own success? Well, by being able to get back to winning. I mean, I okay. think that's that's why I do this. I don't mm-hmm. do it for any other reason than um, I want to win. And I wish we could continue that winning every year because I know what Me that too. feeling is like. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> I think un- unfortunately that if you just look at the you look at our sport and you look at the teams that have had success. It's it's really hard to, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's it's very difficult mm-hmm. to sustain that success and never never dip down and and have to, uh, you know, rebuild is is there's a lot of things behind that word which mm-hmm. is I, I don't how mind. do you define it? Um, I don't define it the way I think people do, which is where you tear everything down and mm-hmm. you get rid of every remnant of the past and uh you it's that's probably a seven to ten year process to to build it back up okay um and i don't know that there's an example of like all the teams that have had success i don't know that they did that they may have done what you said which is rebuild but they didn't come that that wasn't on the heels of a lot of success boston kind of did Boston did, did a little bit. They won an 11. Okay. Then they missed the playoffs. They made some changes. McAvoy, these guys come in. But that core was still there. So they had the dip. Right. Which I would say the Hawks have had in the last, you know, haven't won a playoff series since 2015. And then 
they've they've been pretty good. They've been they've been pretty good. They've had that kind of sustained success. They had the one year with the three draft picks. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't like to your point. It's not impossible, but very difficult. Okay. They, they're the one example I would say. Um, you had the letter came out today. You also had the press conference with Joel and Jeremy. The Joel's firing and Jeremy introduce him. And you said it was about, uh, I want to get this right. I have it written down here. We want to maximize each and every opportunity with our playoff goals in mind and create c- continued growth and development throughout the roster. Uh, that was a quote that you had when, when Joel was fired and you're introducing Jeremy. Similar type of tones, I would say, with the uh, letter today. Would you agree? Um, uh, some similar tones. Similar I, would, okay. I would agree. Now, you made the decision, and you also said in another interview, I think it was with Emily Kaplan, uh, that Jeremy is known, and he's great at development. Okay, he's bringing along their young players. I've listened to podcasts with um, Spitting Chicklets, with Andrew Shaw, Duncan Keith, a lot of these guys saying, Joel was unbelievable to my development. Greatest coach I've ever had. Would not be in the NHL, Andrew Shaw specifically, would not even be in the NHL had I not landed in a place with Joel Quendel, What made you think that Joel no longer had the ability to bring along the young players in the way that you want? And what evidence do we have to show that Jeremy is actually great at that? Because it's Kirby Doc is obviously a sensational talent. Bolquist, Nylander, some of these other young guys that you really need. Uh, didn't I didn't see it. So I'm hoping you could explain where, like, where those, where Colleton's fingerprints are on those guys specifically, because you know they're, they're you're here for basically the whole year, uh, and then healthy scratches in the bubble. So that's another thing where I'm I'm having a hard time reconciling. Joel no longer can do it. Jeremy's the guy, but we haven't, at least to you know someone like me, which I don't necessarily know everything or know sure. or not at that level. So I'm hoping you could explain where that development is and what we should look for. Uh, in the future with those guys. Yeah, I think um, a couple, a lot of questions there. I'll try to take them one by one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the healthy scratch part, I think, is a good thing because I think one of the things we need to communicate better is that um, there's there's a stigma associated with that. I, you brought it up as, mm-hmm. health, like, in other words... In the bubble, when you're trying to win. So if you think that those guys can't... Like, you're absolutely doing everything you can to win in a playoff series. Right. And those guys are not your best 20 players in your top 20. Right. But the, the, the process, the, the, what we've got to try to get to as, as a, not only a team, but in, in conversations with yourself, is mm-hmm. to explain that the progress for young players is not a straight line. Absolutely not. So yeah. part of it is the feedback. So part of it is if they're not doing what the – like there's, there was no way of knowing – when if you're a healthy scratch that the season was going to end then could have gone back in the next game and been good so i think that that part of the process in developing players is that feedback like Mm -hmm. that's something you don't get a chance to see but when you ask me why do i know that jeremy's that that's his strength is the ability to sit with players and explain to them what he likes about their game what he doesn't like and work with them Mm one-on-one I think Jeremy is excellent at that. I've seen him do it, and I've seen the impact that he's had other places. Uh, in particular, when we hired him from Sweden, he took a team that was uh, very marginally talented, and mm-hmm. he won the thing, and he promoted them to the top league. And basically, he they were a group of overachievers, mm-hmm. and he was able to mobilize this limited talent group and get the most out of them comes to Rockford does the same thing yep. it was a it was a lot of older players that in that that mm-hmm. year um, who you know really never played in the NHL after that uh, but he was able to f- tap into them get them to buy in and like f- the feedback from those players if you were to talk to Lance well, Puma Hin- and, Hin- and Hin- Frank- is says that Collins the best coach he's ever had right so uh, there is I, I'm, I'm just trying to get you to say it well, so, I, I'm you know. not going to say he's the best coach no, in the I'm world. Just, I'm, I'm just, trying to uh, get you to that, espouse with specifics about why you think he's so great with developing players. Because I, I see what he the way that he approaches it is the way that young players today need the feedback. So okay. I've got a 
I've got a son that's 18 years old. So I know that how that, how they need, they need to understand it. They need to understand why you're doing something. Mm -hmm. They need you to show them. Then they need to be given the opportunity to do it. And then you need to give them feedback. That's, that's a different skill set than what Joel had. Mm -hmm. Joel was a different kind of coach. So I'm not saying he didn't develop Andrew Shaw. He developed in a different way. Andrew Shaw is a different person than Kirby Doc. Of course. So I think all the people that are, I've noticed a big change in the athletes of the last few years are night and day from the guys that are in their thirties. How, how so? Like what's, what's the one example that stands out? You're like, this is way different about, you know, a younger millennial Gen Z type of hockey player than, than a guy who's born in the 80s. They, they need a lot of feedback. They need to see it. They need to talk about it. They need to under, they need to understand it. Mm-hmm. The guys, Shaw's these age and the people in their thirties, you just tell them you got to be better be better tomorrow Mm -hmm. and then get out of here. And then they would come back and like, that's, that's how, when they were teenagers, that's how their coaches dealt with them. So they respond to very little feedback. It's just, you were terrible. Yeah. You gotta be better. Mm -hmm. And then he leaves. But if you, if you say that to Kirby or Boquist, he walks out of there and he's like, what does that mean? What what do I have to do better? Like, what well, what do I like? They want to yeah. do better, mm-hmm. but they actually need you to sit down and and walk them through it. And and so the athletes today, and I've talked about this with our veteran players, like the and it's 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 amazing the difference. It's not just our veteran players. I talked to other GMs; they have the same thing. Like mm-hmm. the guys in their thirties, um, they see things much differently than the guys in their early twenties. Now it's a totally different athlete. And I think it takes a different skill set to connect with that athlete, mm-hmm. and that, and so I've I've seen the way Jeremy handles them, and I'm very optimistic that he's going to have um, continued success with connecting and because those at the end of the day those players they need some something in their game isn't there otherwise they would just be like star players already right. they all have a measure of talent mm-hmm. they wouldn't have gotten it of course to the NHL. Yeah if they were lacking, but they don't have it all. So you have to try to figure out what is it that they're missing. Mm -hmm. So one skill set is observation. You got to figure out what it is. Then you've got to connect with them in a way that they can receive your message and then they can go deliver on it. Is, is this, um, can a coach make a player feel responsible for his own competition level? Is that something that Jeremy, because I, you know, I'm thinking specifically about a guy like Nylander, where he, you're right, like he flashes at times, and it's like, holy shit, like this kid has got it, mm-hmm. and then you don't see him do that again for 30 games. So, and it just, it, it, how does a coach get the light switch to come on where it seems like a guy like Taves, Kane, Kirby, Doc, these guys are kind of self starters. Is sure. there, is there an element of that that goes into the evaluation, and is that part of a development arc as well? Yes, I think that's something that uh, certainly a coach can have an impact. Uh, uh, he can't impact it as much as the player himself can. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it comes with a, a maturity for a player who um, you know has to look around. You have to observe what characteristics the coach values. And and there's, there's a reason that certain players are getting opportunities because they're displaying that. And then you've got to be able to put that all together and – it's it's not quite there yet for Alex. I think so. A lot of it's on him too, but mm-hmm. I think the coach has to play a role in that because he has to um, he has to tap into the things that they do well and reinforce that, and then also point out the things when if they're not as engaged as they need to be, and and pull ice time away, pull them out of the lineup, yep. get their attention that way. Because but most of these players like I you don't have a chance to know them they they all want they want to please they want to do well mm-hmm. some of them haven't figured it out some of them won't figure it out but it's our job while we have them is to try to get the most out of them do and this is unrelated to any player currently on the roster is there like an age or a marker or some type of thing where you're just like this kid doesn't have it has that ever happened to you in your in your I mean you've been here a long time is that ever just, have you just written a kid off and be like he's this is he doesn't have it uh, as far as that, like being engaged, you mean, yeah. or just, yeah. um, and you don't have to say their name. I'm just wondering if there is like, all right, like he's 24. 
He doesn't have it. Is that something that happens? Yeah, certainly. I mean, if, if a player has been pro for four or five years mm -hmm. and – when you say pro, do you mean NHL or AHL? Or I mean both? professional, not like college or junior. Because okay. I think mm -hmm. some, some kids are 24, but they've only been a pro for one year. Right, like and, Kubelik or – yeah. Well, well he, no, he's been a pro for forever. Right. The opposite of that. Yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. more yeah. like a guy who – College kid. He could be 24, yeah. but mm -hmm. you know, he might have been uh, successful in college for you know the team he was on or whatnot. And so, so setting those guys aside um, – yeah, I, I can think of some guys. I think what what happens more often than not, though, is guys come into the league and um, they they lose their confidence in doing what got them to that point. Mm -hmm. And then some guys can't figure out how they can reshape their game to be effective for the Blackhawks. So most of the players that get drafted are typically some of the better players on their team. I mean, that's how they get drafted. Right. right? Yep. Which means they're, they're probably power play type guys. Mm -hmm. um, but then they come to Chicago and like, they look at our team and even now, or if you even rewind it to when we had Hosa and Sharp and they're like, well, he's never going to be on the power play, but can he figure out that I can, Dave Boland's a great example. Like Dave was a, uh, he was a one huge of, player for London. But he figured out pretty yeah. quickly that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he had 150 points, I think, in junior hockey yep. uh, before he turned pro. Um, but he figured out quicker than most guys that, all right, well, they, they want me to do this. Mm -hmm. All right, like that that's what they need. Then I'll do that. Then I'll just be kind of a bit of a rat, and I'll mm -hmm. be tough to play against, and I'll kill penalties and never played on the power play, really. Yep. Uh, but I would say Dave is, is – um, unique in that other guys take a longer time like Bick was we had a long we had a hard time getting Bick to kind of buy into what he could be mm -hmm. he was a, he scored 50 goals I think his last year junior yeah and you know and the, it was the playoffs he needed that he needed the spotlight er, that's well, what it felt like as a fan watching well I think it it just took uh it but it, the reason it took him a while to even make the NHL mm -hmm. was because he wanted to be that the goal scorer and I think and he, f he figured out okay well I'm a big guy I can use my body and I can shoot the puck and I, I you know it took him longer to kind of figure that out though I, don't, I think he was probably what 25 26 before yeah he figured it out mm -hmm. so guys have different the timelines so. team was also loaded too like, yeah but I yeah. think but but Brian played an important role and I think he 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 filled a role that probably he didn't have for himself Okay. Which is like he was a goal scorer. I mean, he was a dominant junior player, but he was bigger than everybody mm -hmm. at that age, and he scored kind of just at will. He couldn't do that, but he found a way to to contribute to the team. Once once it took him three or four years though of being a pro, and you know he was kind of teetering on what is he even going to make the NHL? Yeah. And he did because he figured it out. So we have some guys that have to look at our team now and figure out. All right. I want to be on the top line power play, but they don't seem to put me there or want me there, but I can help the team this way. I think that's some of the stuff that we point out to them and then they've got to internalize it and find a way to help the team. Mm -hmm. now, speaking of guys who took a long time to get the NHL level, Corey Crawford. So I feel like that was, that sent shockwaves everywhere. So how did that, there's a report that there was a one, one year offer mm -hmm. for him. And they ended up taking two for 3.9. When did you make the decision that you were moving on from Corey Crawford? Well, it was we, we talked to Corey when the season ended. And it was the, the biggest thing for us was we knew that whether Corey came back for one or two, three years, he wasn't going to be the goalie of the future for us. We needed to find the next goalie. Mm -hmm. um, so the issue with it really became an issue of the term. So if, if we had signed Corey to, he wasn't interested in one year. That was more our preference because mm -hmm. what we were going to do is try to find what one of the goalies we had mm -hmm. and see how they looked this year. And then if they didn't look ready for that role, then we would be in a position next summer where we would be in the market for a goalie. Mm -hmm. uh, but if Corey was back for another year, then the opportunity, there's like an opportunity cost. Once you sign a player you can't unsign him you can't mm -hmm. sign him to two years and then after one year say actually we're going to go get one of these other goalies it, it it would block out the opportunity so 
for us, it became a term issue. We wanted a short, we wanted flexibility mm -hmm. to be able to either promote one of our guys from within who had shown they could do it or go out into the marketplace a year from then. But with Corey coming back for two or three years, that, that was not going to be an opportunity next year. So you just drafted the kid from the development program, yep. eight, 18. Um, obviously, he's not going to be ready. Who knows? Four, five, six years, something like that. Wouldn't Why was a second year for Corey just a non-starter for you guys? Because to me, and again, pull holes in this. I'm inviting you to pull holes in this. But if you say, hey, like it's going to be Corey for two years, and Corey, you're going to get 35 games, 40 games going to be an even split and we're going to evaluate the other kids at the nhl level suban Lank lankanen or delia and whoever isn't the backup and you can send uh can you send them up and down with their deals or who would have to clear waivers would it be delia uh, um delia and suban would need waivers both yeah. both would need waivers. <clears throat> so you talk maybe you're able to talk one guy in rockford maybe not maybe that's where some of this problem is but so you have a guy getting full-time minutes in rockford and part-time minutes in, in Chicago and you're able to evaluate them and just kind of kick that can down the road because I don't think anybody around the NHL is looking at Subban and Delia and be like those are the goalies for the future no one's going to mix up them with Carter Hart or somebody like that so was that ever something that was like hey we can buy ourselves another year while we continue this search and then you just spent 11 million dollars on goaltenders last year if, he, if he's at 3.5 or 3.9 over two years you're still saving you still have 7 million dollars to play with it wasn't so much the money, though. Like I said, for me, it was more the term. Because once you sign Corey for two years, mm -hmm. then you're not – if there's a – there's going to be a lot of goalie movement next year because of the expansion draft. Yep. Like So I, I would imagine that that's the way typically it goes. Like there's um, there's going to be goalies either selected by them that get moved. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't need five goalies. But I think that there are – like te teams aren't going to be able to protect all these goalies. There's going to be young goalies uh, available – so, but if you've got Corey, then you're not in the market for a goalie. If a good goalie... Why do you say that, though? I don't understand. Uh, that's what I don't understand. So if you have Corey, he's a top 10 goalie right now. Right. And you're out in the market for your, his replacement, the goalie of the future. I don't understand why him at 3 or 3.5 three, or even 4 precludes you from attracting another guy who's like, hey, you're going to split time for one year and then it's yours. Well, but you, don't, you may be getting a goalie that's that's already making some money. Like you may be getting a goal that's making, I don't know how much money by that point. Like the, the, the point is we don't know who this is going to be available, but mm -hmm. once you commit, once you sign a guy, you don't unsign him. So then it takes you out of, you have less flexibility than you do now. We have a lot more flexibility now as we're going into this season, we've got three goalies mm -hmm. that we want to give a chance to see. Columbus was in this position last year. They mm -hmm. let Bobrovsky go. Yep. They had Corpusalo, Ms. Lickens. They, they, neither one of them had, had done really. They, they were kind of, you would talk about them a year ago the way you're talking about our goalies, which is Ms. Lickens had never played a game. Mm -hmm. Corpusalo had played, many as Subban has, 50, 60 games. Um, so they weren't, they weren't as, not, now you're looking at it through the common, today's eyes, right? Yeah. They both had really good seasons. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know if that's what's going to happen with our goalies. Yeah. But, I think we have to give them an opportunity. I, I, I hear you. I, I guess my point would be if you're trying to win and you're trying to make the playoffs, and it, it's I, I, that's where I struggle because I keep going through this prism like we want to be competitive. Like you don't, you don't, you're not planning on tanking or anything. No. Okay, so you want to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Having a top 10 goalie with a cap hit of three, five to $4 million is a tremendous blessing. And that's what Corey Crawford would have. So, like, I understand the opportunity, like, wanting to have an opportunity. I don't see how taking a team that was, by many statistical measures, one of the worst defensive teams in the league last year. Now, I do like your moves in terms of what you did, what you brought in. We can talk about that, too, this summer with Walmart and whatever. Um, how does that – it's another thing where I just can't reconcile it. So I think it's the, the cap – I think what you're, you're overlooking is the – the, the difficulty with the flat cap and the ability to just to move money around is is going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. The cap is going to be the same, uh, and it's better to have the flexibility next year than to be committed. That So it's fine if you wouldn't do it that way. I'm just telling you that the flexibility was important to us to be able to 
not have our hands tied. You, it's only three or four million dollars to you, but that's a lot of money. It's not my money, and it's certainly a lot of money. It, it's just. Do it's you, not. It's not just. It's a lot of money. It's. It's, it's the cap. I under, it's the flexibility, mm-hmm. and like we we want to be in a position. We would love to be in a position where we have a lot more cap room, so that we could take advantage of a team that's got a. There's going to be t- play, players available even next mm-hmm. summer with the uh, expansion draft. There's going to be teams looking to move guys they don't want to lose. So there there's going to be players available. But if you don't have that four million dollars, that, that could be the difference between getting a a player and not getting a player. And it may not pan out that way, mm-hmm. but we have a lot more flexibility. I think that's something we can agree on. Yeah. We have more flexibility. It just maybe you wouldn't want the flexibility if you were doing it. I I I always say having options is great. So I, I'm with you with that element of it. I just I don't think I can be convinced that you're better off with a top ten goalie at a at a bargain rate. I, I just I have a hard time struggling with that, but that, again, these, these are these are decisions that you made. I'm wondering if you ever decided, like, hey, I know you said you talked to him right before the season, but clearly you must have been thinking about next year, six months in advance, twelve months in advance. Like you knew his deal was up. The bubble presented a unique opportunity. If you if you had this idea that you were going to be moving on from Crawford or that it was even possible to move on from Crawford, why not start the evaluation process then? With, with Delia or Subban or Lankin and in the bubble in high leverage situations instead of going to Crawford, who's coming back from COVID and the whole thing? Well, I mean, I, I guess you could second guess it, but at the same time, I think at that time, you're when you're there in the bubble trying to win that game, mm-hmm. I think everyone would agree that Corey gave your team a better chance to win. And I guess then that should still hold true. Well, but, but things are now different as far as the – you can't compare when you you got a one game to win mm-hmm. versus looking at the next season and couple seasons. They're they're, they're not exactly the same. But it, sure, <clears throat> but it's like a, it's like a cost benefit thing. So it's like, hey, like we can if if we know you had to know that that was not going to be a team that was winning the Stanley Cup, correct? Heading into the bubble. Oh, uh, look, crazy C- things. Come on, crazy come things on. happen. So Stan. That team. I mean, you finished twelfth in the regular season. You're giving up a ton of goals and chances. Like you, you knew you weren't going to go four rounds with that team. Well, I guess I don't look at it that way, though. I don't. How, look how at do you it look at it? As I, you try to stay in the moment a little bit more. Like I didn't know if we were going to beat Edmonton either. I thought if we played well, we could, and we mm-hmm. did. Yeah. I mean, we. I, I. I guess based on your logic, you would say we have no chance to beat Edmonton. They were. No, I didn't say the, that. Well, but but by by saying that, by saying we had no chance to, to do anything. I don't know if we do or we didn't because I don't I don't look at it that way. I don't look at it as trying to predict what we're going to do. It'll unfold the way it unfolds. Yes, but you, this is where we're talking about like but through your own words about this is trying to win and balancing it with the future. If you evaluate those guys and having Delia or Subban in there stifles your ability to win and you lose that series to Edmonton. What do you get? A top eight pick. So if, if you're trying to stockpile more good players and evaluate these goalies, knowing that there's a chance that you're moving on or, or a good chance or maybe you're, it's just Corey Crawford is not coming back, then it, it to me, the logic would follow that it's like, we're going to start this process now because we, we did this exercise with this roster for 70, 71, 72 games or whatever it was, and it wasn't good enough. So we have this opportunity in the bubble to but, play – Go but ahead. but there was benefit gained by the experience of our players being in that environment. So I've always yeah. I so you can't that. really quantify whether uh, you don't know when you're playing Edmonton that you're going to only win one more round. What if you win two more rounds? And so like it's impossible to know that you're you're, you're looking at it in a way in hindsight, which is when you're there, you want to win, mm-hmm. and you do your best to try to win, and then when that's finished, now you look at this season and the next several seasons and look at the flexibility that we have and that's why we went the way that we went it it seems to me and maybe i'm just not understanding but it seems like conflicting ideas and it it seems like either on this path where we're stockpiling new players well i think that's the problem is you you're you've you've painted only two paths which is stockpiling Mm -hmm. all young or all in on trying to win. 
What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't have to be so binary. It's not just A or B. That's the difference between us. I don't look at it as either you're you're going all in to try to win every single game every year or you're just going and But only I'm not look- saying that either. I'm not saying that either. Well, I'm not so- saying it sounds like you Okay, are. well I'd like to clarify that sure. because what I'm saying is specifically to the bubble. I think that there was enough evidence throughout the regular season to say that you know, going up against Vegas and going up against, you know, whoever was but you don't you're playing you don't know you're playing Vegas. My point, you don't know anything. You know that you're going to have to beat the best teams in the league to win the Stanley Cup. You know that. Sure. Okay. So, you've run that experiment with that roster for 80% of a regular season. Mhm. 12th place. At that so if I I'm glad they had the playoff experience. I I agree with you that's invaluable. I agree that you should always be like putting your p- players in a position where they're chasing wins and playing in high leverage opportunities. I don't know that going one extra round is more beneficial than having an extra top 10 pick. But you don't know at the time that like, you know it now because you're looking backwards when you're sitting there before a game of Edmonton, mm-hmm. you don't know that you're going to be playing nine games in the playoffs. And this is game one of nine. You're going to win these three, mm-hmm. lose one and then win. And then lo- you don't know that. So you've got to do, you got to do in the moment what you're doing. And then, so you could you you might have a different feeling if we if we had beat Vegas and then lost to Colorado, it, you would still say it's but, not worth but, it. But but you might have a different feeling then too because then if you beat Vegas, I might. I, I, but yeah, I, I, but, but that's what I mean. So then it's like then we should bring back Corey because I I didn't hate like you made a lot of moves last year of, of a guy who was trying to win. You bring back Shaw, you bring in Dahan, you bring back or you, you trade for Mata. You're doing a lot of things to make yourself better defensively, and. and kind of being like we're trying to get back to the playoffs and it worked out in a crazy <clears throat> way that you did and mm-hmm. you got the opportunity to play these these big games but and i think if you had kept a lot of that i like you know like what zadorov brings i like some of these other things i think you could have sprinkled and and got your maybe not to where you're in the stanley cup finals again next year but you might be back with doc and these guys where you're you're solidly in the mix as opposed to seventh place in the central so that is, you know, I didn't, I was, I was surprised that Corey wasn't back because I, I've been optimist by nature, but I could see like this path where it's like, okay, we have the Han and Murphy, let's have them healthy. And you have this path and it just seemed like now it's like, well, we, we're, we're not going down that path. We're going down this alternate road road and that's fine, but it, it doesn't necessarily jive with these, the other moves. So it's like, you're trying to keep goals out of your net, but you're not bringing Crawford back. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know how else to say it other than f- for that. Like, uh, well, we're not going to agree on that, which well, that's, is that's fair. Mm-hmm. That's fine, and I'm not here to try to convince you uh, otherwise. Um, I, I respect. I wish you would. <laughs> I, I respect your opinion. You yeah. you see it differently than yeah. I do, okay. and I think based on where we are, I think this makes more sense. But, okay. Well, then let's talk about the guys you brought in because I actually I like them a lot. Sure. So where do you see guys like Walmart and Yanmark? Um, fitting into the forward group i think they look like they're guys who compete like those are guys those are playoff type players to me uh what do you envision for them i think people are saying bottom six is that where you see them slotting in or do you think Uh, walmart or somebody else might have more well i think yanmark he's the more experienced of the of the two um you know he's got four or five years under his belt uh i think you know he broke into the league he was more of a scorer um Mm -hmm. you know he's i think 19 18 goals a couple years in a row the last couple of years, they've used him differently. I think that speaks to his versatility, um, and I think in a lot of ways he plays a, a solid two-way game. So mm-hmm. he's a bigger guy, you know. He's uh, six one, two hundred pounds. So he's uh, he gives us uh, you know a little bit of a bigger profile on the wing. Uh, and I think the the thing that's appealing about Matias is his ability to play with better players. So he could play up mm-hmm. in the lineup. But when he's playing with those guys, he doesn't kill the play, but he also has pretty good um, puck management and instincts to not put us in a bad spot. Mm-hmm. So I think he could he could play up the lineup, complement skilled players, and maybe bring a little bit more stability to the line. Uh, so is he a sod replacement in your eyes? Stylistically, he's similar. Okay. Yep, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, you know that's kind of his his game that he's got the ability to score, but he's not a high end scorer. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he doesn't beat the puck up like he can. Yeah. He can play with guys, and they're not going to say like, "Get this guy off my line," because mm-hmm. he can. Does that happen? 
Sure, sure okay. it does. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just ask those guys who. Well, I know. I'm just yeah. wondering if that gets like how far up the chain that goes. Oh, I mean, I think sometimes it's what's unspoken is you're around these guys enough, you mm-hmm. kind of get a feeling for okay. for that. Um, so, but he can play uh, really anywhere in the lineup. I mm-hmm. think he could play left wing, right wing, you know, up and down the the lines. Uh, Walmart is appealing. And like you said, Matias is, is a pretty competitive kid. So uh, I was impressed watching him firsthand in the playoffs in the bubble. Uh, just that uh, he's kind of got that engine that just keeps going. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we need a little bit more of that uh, top to bottom. I agree. Like mm-hmm. relentlessness. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's something that you can never have too many of those guys. So uh, I I like that style that he brings. Um, so Lucas Walmart's a uh, I guess some ways he's similar. He's a centerman though. So I think that's the, that's nice that he can play the wing, but mm-hmm. he, he can play in the middle. He, pretty good face off guy for a young guy. He was over 50% for a, a guy just, you know, working his way into the NHL, which is good. Um, he's actually got a lot of talent. I think the thing that's held him back um, when he was a junior player, I remember from the draft, he was always like the best guy on the Swedish team. He just was not a very good skater those years. Yeah. So I think he slipped down to the fourth round, not based on talent. Like he should have been probably a first round pick. He's yeah. really got good instincts. He can play. He's got some competitiveness, makes plays, responsible. Uh, he was just too slow back then, but he's really, he's, he's improved mm-hmm. his skating to a part now where it doesn't hold him back. Uh, so I, I darling think, loves him too for whatever that's worth. Yeah, I, I think he's great. I think he's really, uh, and he's not a flashy player. Mm-hmm. Like he's probably someone got fans aren't that familiar with. Yeah, nope. uh, well, he split time, um, and then Zadorov. Like that was that you know, was a big trade. It's probably the second biggest move as opposed to uh, other than letting Crawford walk. Sure. Um, is that a guy that you look at and you're like, he's perfect for Bolquist? Yeah. The, for me, that was a big. The, that was maybe something that's gotten lost in the shuffle of that move because he was traded for Saad. Um, but I, I'm really optimistic for his impact being more than just his own skill set. Mm-hmm. Uh, number, he's an, a unique player. He's an intimidating player. And the thing that I like about his style is you got some guys that are big, big physical defensemen, but uh, he's got no fear to go after the other team's best play. He, mm-hmm. he would go after Kaner, and he doesn't. A lot of times, guys don't want to do that because they know they're they're going to have to pay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he'll he'll go after whoever whoever they we're playing against. Mm-hmm. He doesn't care at all. Come yeah. come at me is what yeah. he says. And I think, well, when you're six five two forty, yeah, and he's yeah. not afraid. Yeah, and I, I, you know, he likes the he like he's more of a simplistic player. Like he's he's not going to be rushing the puck up mm-hmm. the ice. Uh, he's got he's a decent passer, so I think he. It's not like he's hopeless with the puck. Uh, he's just not he's not a overly creative player. But I look at him as being someone that's going to help us get more out of Mitchell and Boquist because I think those guys they've got the skating, they've got the skill, they've got that they're smaller defensemen. Mm-hmm. And you know Adam got hit a few times hard last year, and I think we'll get more out of Boquist with. Zadorov as his partner, or if he's not his partner, he's on the defense, mm-hmm. and it's going to help accelerate. Hit. We need Adam and we need Mitchell to be players for us. Yeah, there's no question. Like we so, we have, they have a lot of talent. Yeah. We've got to have them to to be able to bring more of it out. And so I think he can help with that. I certainly agree. So that sounds like you're planning on Mitchell. You've got him penciled in somewhere in the top six for a defenseman. I well, like I said a little earlier, I think I want him to be part of this team whether he's here for every game mm-hmm. or whether he has to miss some games or whether he has to start in Rockford or start here, go to Rockford. I think he's shown me a lot. I think he was probably ahead of Boquist a year ago, but he decided to go back mm-hmm. to college. Did you try to sign him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had so him you at, guys thought he was ready. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I okay. had long talks with him. Uh, and he, you know, I, I, you'll get to know Ian over the, over the next year I actually skated with him at Denver. Did you? Yeah, I was in some charity thing, and we did. I don't know. It was, did you? Did you? It, was, it, was, it was his freshman year when Monty was still there. Okay. Um. So we did like a shootout thing. He looks you in the eye. You could tell he's got good parents. You could tell he wants yeah. to be great. Um. I. I impressive very high kid. Yeah, impressive very kid. Impressive. Like yeah. uh, hockey aside, like mm-hmm. I think he's the kind of 
player you need more of. He's he's I, gonna yep. be a leader on this team. So uh, I, I'm very optimistic for his contributions. I don't know. We got to give him a chance though. Mm-hmm. If he's not ready right away, then that's not the end of the world. And I expect him to be. Rockford might be a wagon. Hey, you know Evan, I don't know. Evan Barrett. Uh, yeah. Have you any chance he makes this team? It seems like you. you... I think he needs some development okay. time. Mm-hmm. I think that, that you know Evans on that. That he's got that competitiveness too. Yeah. He's feisty. Mm-hmm. He's really. He's actually got great playmaking for a guy that's probably more on the the competitor gritty side. Mm-hmm. He makes a ton of plays. He, he point per game guy in college. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. For, so for him, it's his, mm-hmm. his foot speed. Like his yep. skating. He's not a fast player. Right. But you know he's been he's been here skating and training and working on his uh, you know his fitness level. So you know I think that. He's probably going to need some time, though. I, I don't. I, I'd be pleasantly surprised. He's only twenty-one, mm-hmm. so you know he's in that he's in that competitive mix that I I think we need more of. Okay, and then you got like nine defensemen that are kind of NHL ready. Are we anticipating any moves, or or maybe not NHL ready, but knocking on the door? You know, we talk about Bodan, Seabrook still in the mix. Sounds like people are saying he's looking like he's in great shape. Which right. people don't typically say that, so must be true. Yep. And uh, it, do you anticipate it? Are you done, think you're done for the summer? Are you going to Cabo like Eddie was joking before? Or do you, <laughs> you have still more work to do? Not going to Cabo. You but, shot that down quick. What do you do for fun? Uh, Golf yeah, what do you do for fun? Uh, I didn't mean to shoot it down that quick. Sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> Guy hates Cabo. Nothing wrong with Cabo. <laughs> Ed, um, this is Cabo Ed. So <laughs> okay. one, once a year, I feel You guys like will it. have to bring me down there. Yeah, yeah come on. Um no, yeah, I, I like the. I don't play golf. I used to golf a lot when I was younger. Um, mm-hmm. I still love it. I just don't play that much compared to before. Um, uh, I don't. I don't have any great hobbies to to entertain you guys with. So no, I, I hate that too. Question yeah. hobbies. It's like, what do you mean? I work. Yeah, <laughs> you know? hobby. Uh, I, I agree. We had a big discussion where it's like, I don't want to be known as a guy who is like has a hobby. Yeah, I don't <laughs> like collect I, like football helmets. Or yeah, nothing. no, like, being collector would be weird too. Um, so you're. So the team is probably the team. Yeah, probably. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think like on the back end, we we have a lot of young defensemen. Like Regula is another guy that I'm pretty, uh, you know, eager to see him mm-hmm. as a pro. He was really good in uh, in London last year, and we brought him to the bubble. And uh, you know, he didn't play, but he was with our group. And mm-hmm. you know, big six five kid, uh, righty. Uh, he's got pretty good skill set for a guy that size. So I, I think, um, you know, when you look at Bodan, we've got Carlson. He, you know, he showed. He looks like a nice player. Yeah, he's yeah. got some. Uh, you know he's got a little bit of edge to his game too, and uh, you know he's, he can mm-hmm. make some plays. So, you know you're gonna which six are gonna start? Uh, that's the magic question. But I don't. We is don't. That, def- is that a question for you, or is that a question for Jeremy? Uh, what's more for Jeremy? Okay. Yeah, I think we've got all these players, and now it's the coach's job to try to put the pieces mm-hmm. together and figure out you know, how we can be successful. Um, but we're, you know you're going to use probably 10 11 defensemen of course through yeah. injuries and through guys not ready to play or struggling so i i don't think we have to figure that out now okay. how it's going to shake up so takeaways this is a transition time still trying to win yes okay so expecting this group to be right there for the playoffs next year well i here's what i'll say i think our team is we don't have enough of we don't have enough depth right now. We're mm-hmm. trying to build it up. And like you said earlier, we don't have uh, – I want to invest in the young players so that instead of going out right now and, and trying to bring in um, a one-year player, we want to try to invest in guys that can be here going mm-hmm. forward. So like Walmart and Yanmark are still young enough that they're one-year deals, so we'll know more at the end of this year. Are they going to be guys that we want to – bring back for two and three and four more years Mm -hmm. they might be yeah but maybe other guys are going to emerge who aren't we haven't even talked about yet i don't know that and let's see how it plays out so i think flexibility over the next over the short term is going to give us more options Mm -hmm. options that we can help our team improve quicker Mm -hmm. so yeah i think we we don't want to lose. We want to win. Okay. Uh, that that's that's. Well, I mean, clear. there are people like the Rangers sent out a memo that I was kind of anticipating coming from you guys, being like, "Here's the thing." But and they was, didn't say if you. Uh, you got to read it again. They never said we were going to be bad. 
They didn't. No, they didn't. But they said, "Hey, well, this hasn't worked. We're going to get rid of a lot of players that you, you know, have come to know and love." And it's they didn't say that we're going to be bad, but like they knew it. They to- they they took kind of took it down to the studs with their McDonough trade and this and that. And then they had the flexibility to go get a Panarin, right? And and they also didn't have three cups though. They didn't have like so they, they were in. They a also little... didn't have Tate and Kane, right? Like, yeah. Of so course, is it, right. they're they're yeah. they're, they're the different people, situation. They are somewhat different, mm-hmm. right? So uh, I think similarities but differences there mm-hmm. so uh i think the the biggest takeaway is that we if we're going to we're going to invest in the younger players because we think the payoff for that down the road will be the greatest and just real quick last one when you say younger players can you give a list of names that you're specifically thinking of besides the defenseman that we've talked about like it is is Nylander the front of that group obviously doc is doc is special so it, it, who are these this group of young players that you're expecting to f- fill out the roster over the next couple of years? Well, it, that it, you're it, investing in. Yeah, and it could it could be players that aren't even here yet. But if, okay. if we if we if we do bring new players in, we're not going to bring in 30 year old players. OK, so uh, if we make trades where we trade a young player, we're going to get a young player back mm-hmm. who we think could fit our mix better if we go down that road. So I think that the, what we're trying to be more open about is saying that we think that's the path forward for our team to build up more depth Mm -hmm. it's going to come from investing in those young players giving them ice time and watching that sometimes they're gonna they may not be great road yeah. yeah yeah and that that has to be we haven't ever taken that approach before and it was if a guy wasn't good enough Mm -hmm. like i was part of it get him get a new guy he can't do it. Bring another okay. guy in. That guy's not good enough. Get rid of him. Bring this guy in. He can't play. This mm-hmm. guy's better. So we did that for a long time, and it worked. Yeah. So we kept doing it mm-hmm. until it thought it, until it didn't work. Yeah. And now we're trying to go a different way, which is not this guy can't do it. Let's get rid of him and bring another guy in. That, that it's it's too hard nowadays when the the, the league is the way it is where. The, the cap is different now than it was even six years yep. ago. Yep. It really is the haves and the have-nots. Do you hate the Canadian dollar? <laughs> no, I don't have a feeling on the Canadian dollar. Well, I feel like it tanked, and then those Taves and Canes uh, contracts stayed at the top of the league when you would anticipate like the cap to continue sure. to go up. Because the dollar, I hate it. Okay. I hate the Canadian okay. <laughs> dollar. It's, you can say it. Well, uh, I, I didn't know what you were getting at. Yeah, that. no, I hate the Canadian dollar. Um, okay, I, I mean... Appreciate you coming in. Do you want to uh, like announce your new title or anything like that while you're here? No, I don't have any new titles to announce. No, nope. not yet. No, 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 no title. Okay. Yep. All right. People are people are in my ear saying you're gonna have a new title. Well, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm okay. Just joking. I'm <laughs> trying to figure out who the next president is. Thought it might be you. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Well, Stan, thanks so much for for coming in. Yeah, it was fun. Good was to get it? to know you guys. You yeah. can say it wasn't. You no, can say it no. wasn't. I mean, hey, okay. this is part of it. We gotta yeah. we gotta be able to talk to you guys more mm-hmm. often and. Uh, do I'm happy again. with my performance. I just dropped the puck <laughs> and I I got out of the way. You got the Cabo comment. Yeah, I yeah. got the Cabo. I had yeah. that. I well, a- we talked like how how do we want to do this? Oh, big interview, and I I've been very vocal about. Oh, I know. Trust oh, you, me. Yeah. Oh, I know. Okay, yeah, you're uh, not a fan. Yeah, but they, that's okay. It's not about you as a person. Yeah. It's just about the you know I don't know you as a person. I All I know it. is that you know the last three years not so great. Um, Are you a fan of him? Probably not. I'm loving him. What do you mean? It's Your son just followed me on you Instagram. You could say that. Yeah. We, we support yeah. that. Like, if you want to say you hate him, I would support no, that. No, I would I, love I, for I'm, you to I'm say that. I'm not a hate guy, though. I don't hate you. I'm not I don't hate, know I'm, you. So, I mean. Well, maybe this is the start of something nice. The one thing I'll <laughs> say is you're very passionate about our team, and I mm-hmm. think we need more people like that. So That, I have heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I am, uh, yeah, I'm very passionate. I, I want to be wrong about everything, just so you know. I want you to be right about everything, and I would like to be wrong about everything. So, but yeah, maybe we can do this again sometime. Sure. We'll do it in the playoffs next year. Okay, and uh, we'll and I'll apologize. This will be the playoffs. I mean, we can we can talk before that. So you can talk to you. I'll give you my number right now. <laughs> Anytime you want something floated out there, I'm happy to float. You want you want me to create a mystery team? I'll create mystery teams. Oh, somebody's involved. I can do that. Okay. For you. Well, you got a lot of reach, so maybe we'll go down that road. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. I, I'll be that mystery team. Okay. Okay. All right, Stan. Thanks so much. Big interview for us. Uh, are we just gonna wrap it up? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, GM of Blackhawks, Sam Bowman. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.